worship and sing together with the Lord and listen to his word. Um, yeah, should be a good day. So um, let's stand and we'll get going. Father, I long to be wise, to see you with new eyes, the truth that was written by your hand. Father, speak truth into me, because I still believe you will help me understand. We are listening to your word. We are My name's Justin, pastor in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, friends of, uh, friend of Matt's. Today's a special day. Uh, we have a baptism that we're going to be able to do, and that's why I'm here. And so um, as we come into the, the worship service this morning, um, it's important to remember that God is the one that calls each of us here. Um, the call to worship is like a time stamp. It, it marks time for us. Each and every Lord's Day, the Lord ushers us into this place to worship Him. Uh, we join with people from history in doing that. Now, this week uh, in, the, in, in our world, in the Presbyterian world, we uh, lost some dear pastors to us, and Harry Reeder and Tim Keller. And you know, Tim is uh, dear to many of us, to Matt and I. And so the call to worship this, this morning is talking about being grateful for all the different ways that God moves and works in our lives. And so uh, Tim was dear uh, to us and dear to me. I was a college pastor um, struggling under the weight of failure, and I went for a run. I had a Walkman on with a compact disc inside of it. That's how long ago this was. And um, Tim was preaching from Colossians chapter 3. He told me my life was hidden with Christ in God. And it's like the way that Tim talked about it to me. It was like I heard the gospel for the first time as a Christian. Like I was a believer, but the gospel was for me. And um, I'm so thankful for that day. It changed my life, the trajectory of my life forever. And so I think it's important for us to like remember those things uh, as a marking of time. Um, to, to praise God for it. And so this morning, I don't know how, what kind of interactions you've had with Tim Keller or Harry Reeder. Um, their lives are precious to God. They're precious to their families. God knows their hours, their days. Um, but we rejoice in their life, and we mark time today and give praise to God for their life as God calls us to worship this morning. So here, God's, uh, here are your call to worship from Psalm 38, 7 to 9. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. 
For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us. Last week, we sang the chorus of this next song. It's the creed. We talked about the Apostles' Creed, if you were here, and that that's a a foundation for our our beliefs in our church. So we're going to sing the whole song this time, so we get a little bit more of the creed and what in the verses, um, and then sing out this chorus with us, and uh, yeah, it should be good. Conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe. 
believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you descended into darkness you rose in glorious light forever seated high I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of... I believe in life eternal. I believe in life eternal, I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Father, we do. We believe in your name and we declare that you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. And God, we look to you as the founder and perfecter of all that is, all that was, and all that ever will be. And we adore you, God. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your mercy to us. Who are we that you are mindful of us? We look to you, Jesus. In your name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to have the stewards come on up. And uh, as they're making their way up, uh, Jamie, you sounded amazing. So thank you for singing out touching my heart. Um, I uh, have the great privilege to invite the stewards up this morning. Now, Andrew and Dot and Thomas uh, just added an an addition to their little family, little Olivia. Um, And the great thing about the stewards is that they were a part of City Pres in Albuquerque, which which is where my friend Justin was the pastor. And uh, you know, little Thomas, he was, he was looking right, just like Olivia on her baptism day. You know, you had a, a gown just like this that you got baptized in. You remember that? No, you don't. Of course you don't. Um, one of the great things about being connected in a denomination is that uh, we get a picture, especially at sacraments, that we transcend our space and even our community that we currently know and you are connected to churches in New Mexico. Uh, you're connected to churches actually all across the world. And you know how uh, when people get tattoos, like you saw Justin, he's got a bunch of tattoos. A sacrament is, is actually a more permanent tattoo that transcends time and space throughout history. And so when we baptize Olivia, we're actually baptizing her into something that is more secure than her actual family. Uh, It's more secure than anything she can actually experience, any of her obedience or disobedience in this life. And what we're baptizing her into is the communion of the Trinity. And that's why we say we baptize you into the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. 
and we get to experience that through relationship with one another. And so Sylvia and Cecil, uh, the, the parents uh, of Dot, had the, have these great stories about the tradition of baptism and what it means through uh, the Stewart family. And so we welcome you as well um, from, from Mississippi and Shirley too. Yeah, hi. So um, uh, Dot and Andrew are going to actually become members, and then we will baptize Olivia. And then what we're going to do is a, a tradition that city president Albuquerque does, which Justin will lead, and he will walk Olivia through the congregation and, and bless her. And you guys are all a part of that today, okay? So Dot and uh, Andrew, do you acknowledge yourself to be sinners in the sight of God? Justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, save in his sovereign mercy. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Okay. Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work? to the best of your ability, yeah? And do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Okay, you guys are getting a taste of Presbyterianism. We like words. We have so many words. Um, And those were the membership vows for Andrew and Dot. Now, these are the baptism vows that they're going to make over Olivia, and then I'm going to ask the congregation a vow, and I want you guys, after that question, to say heartily, yes, we do, Okay. Like, almost like we're a charismatic church. You think you can do that? All right. Dot and Andrew, do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you claim God's covenant promises on her behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do your own? And do you now unreservedly dedicate your child and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example? that you will pray with and for her, and that you will teach her the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. May God have mercy. Okay, congregation. Do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting these parents in the Christian nurture of this child? If so, I want you to say, yes, we do. Yes, we do. All All right. That's what I'm talking about. Love it. Okay. What, yeah, there we go. Let's go. Um, what name have you given this beautiful little girl? Olivia Ann Stewart. Olivia Ann Stewart. Hi. Hi. Olivia Ann Stewart, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I'm going to hand you over to another pastor, okay? Redeemer, this is Olivia Ann. You made very special promises to her today. Promises to uh, remind her of the gospel of Jesus, that she's been called and marked by Jesus on this day forever. Um. And so part of that is like worked out in the practical, just so you know, like those promises involve not just saying words, because we do like words, but they involve changing her diaper. (laughs) They involved uh, volunteering for children's church and Sunday school. Um, Part part of this is like, you're going to love the stewards so much that you're going to recognize their need for help in raising this little one. And yeah, it could be babysitting, or it could be just whenever she finds herself away from them, or away from the Lord, that you call her back, that you remind her of this day, that you remember her baptism for her, and say, you've been marked, you belong to God, you've been washed, You are his. Don't forget this day and don't forget these promises that you made to the stewards and to her. Let's bless her. Little one, for you, God made the world. For you, 
Jesus Christ came just like a little baby, just like you, into the world. For you, God li- Jesus lived and showed God's love. For you, he suffered the darkness of Calvary and cried at the last it is accomplished. For you, he triumphed over death and was raised to new life. For you, he reigns at God's right hand. He did all of this, Olivia, for you, even though you don't know it yet. You do not know it yet, but we will tell you this story again and again until you make it your own. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his counts upon you and be gracious unto you and grant you his peace both today and forevermore. Amen. And I'm going to have you hand Olivia back to the stewards. And after I pray for this family, we're going to sing the doxology very loudly. And let's, uh, let's stand as we do that. Father, that you would be with the stewards, be with Andrew and Dot and Thomas and that you have blessed them in the ways in which they need your grace, Lord, to the measure at which you've given the grace to Andrew and Dot and Thomas, that they would pour that into Olivia's life. And we trust that you will, in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. All right, it's our practice here at Redeemer to greet one another. So say hello to someone around you, and then we'll come back with announcements in a minute. Are we gonna Are we gonna sing the creed to come back? Say doxology to come back. What's up, bud? Redeemer. You may be seated. You may stop talking. All right, children, children's church, preschool through third grade, you're dismissed. Make your way to the basement, sign in. Parents, please get them afterwards. Um, 
the big ones will be over here in the office, the little ones will be back here. And just so you can prep, in June, July and August, we're not gonna have the older kids um, children's church. And we might need a couple more volunteers to teach. Um, and that means like just one Sunday, you do children's church for the, you get a buddy, the buddy system, and you can teach um, one Sunday this summer. Um, we'd love to have you. It's great to touch base with our little ones. I actually enjoy working in the nursery every couple months because you love to just see their progression. It's the same thing with children's church. Go in there and talk to kids about God. It's uh, really refreshing. Okay, we have a congregational meeting directly after the service. There won't be lunch and child care. We'll just try to get right to it. Um, so please stick around for that. Also, um, I know this says it's in the bulletin, but sometimes the bulletin doesn't have the right time. So I'm telling you, um, Claire just sent an email about the fourth and fifth graders are having a picnic today. It's not at 2.30, it's not at 1.30, it's at 1 o'clock. And it's for two hours. They'll have games, Roberts Park. So don't look at that time, 1 o'clock. Is that it, Claire? Okay, all right. There is a wedding shower next Sunday um, for Asher and Ashna. Everybody's invited, male and female. So we invite everyone to come party at the Odom's home and celebrate marriage next week at 3. Um, there's more details in the bulletin about if you'd like to get a gift off their registry. You don't have to. We just want you to come celebrate with us. Um, we talked about this a little bit in announced, not here, but in um, other emails, that there's a little free pantry right here um, beside the church. And um, UNL's Rotary Club put that up for us, asked if they could do it because um, they've done some research in have felt that there's several students living in this area that don't always have enough food. So if you have food that you would like to bring, non-perishables for that, and that's full when you bring it, just put it in the kitchen. We'll put it out when it's empty. Um, I think people have been using it already. They are gonna fill it once a month for us, but there'll be plenty of opportunities for us. And if you happen to be someone who's having a slim margin for that month, please go help yourself. This is for everybody. You know, sometimes we give and sometimes we receive, so please just use that um, resource. And now it's time for the offering, so let's pray as we get ready for that. Heavenly Father, you own the cattle on a thousand hills, and you do not need our money, but you've chosen to put your love on us, so please help us take steps of faith towards you and give you what is already yours with a joyful heart. Bless our giving and use it for your glory and for the mighty work of your kingdom. Amen. guys, we're, we're in Ruth 2. I'm going to jump right in because it's the whole chapter. Um, this is God's word to you. This is living and active and breathing. And so uh, give your attention to God's word from Ruth 2, the whole chapter. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she, she went out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young man, 
who has charge over the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who is in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves and the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I'm a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and your mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. And when she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean among the sheaves, and do not reproach her, and also pull out some of the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. And so she gleaned in the field until evening. And then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about half an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where do you glean today, and where have you worked? Blessed is the man who took notice of you. And so she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, This man's with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young man, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the evening of the barley and the wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. That's God's word to you this morning. It's our practice here to spend some moments in silence. And what we're doing in that moment and in this space together is that we're asking for God to reveal himself to us in ways that are new and fresh. That's exactly what happened with Naomi. You know, she was uh, of the people of God, and she was bitter, and she came into a deeper awareness of who God was, the gospel, um, even as a person of God. And so, uh, regardless, if you feel like you are unfamiliar with this church thing, or if you feel like you are very familiar with it, we all need the same thing. We all need God's steadfast love to be poured into our hearts like it was on little Olivia. And so, let's let's ask for that as we uh, look at this text. Father, Son, and Spirit, you uh, were here before we entered this space. Your Spirit hovers over all, controls all, and through your Spirit uh, flow eternal life. And we ask that we would get into the current of that goodness. Um, We see it here in this text. We see it um, at baptisms. We uh, sense that it could be true for us, for all of us. And so, Lord, by your Spirit, teach us that Jesus is where it's at. Jesus is who Boaz and Ruth point to, and Jesus is where we find not only security, but the the deep thing that we most need to be favored in your eyes, for you to look on us and for you to be satisfied, to be known by you. And so would you do that right now in uh, small ways and in ways that are very 
uh, very powerful in Christ's name. Amen. So the, the favor of God is the biblical teaching of what we're all after, that we desire for our creator to, to look on us and to be pleased. And if we don't get that on the divine level, we will search for it everywhere. The tricky thing about uh, how God works is that we oftentimes come into the awareness of that through community and through relationship in a, in a similar way that Justin said he came into the deeper awareness of the gospel, even as a Christian, through a sermon, through, through Tim Keller. Um, in each of our lives, God has placed you in the lives of other people and other people in the lives of you to reteach you what he's like. And that's a daily thing. And in our, in our passage here, it's, you can't miss it. That word for favor is used uh, many times in verses 2 10 and 13, but that word can also be translated grace. That uh, grace is something that you get when you really need a break. Grace is something that you get that's, un, that's undeserved. These women needed a break. Ruth and Naomi, they needed a break and they caught one in, Bo, in Boaz. One of my favorite authors is a lady named Marilyn Robinson. And Marilyn Robinson wrote a book of essays called The Givenness of Things. And in those essays, she basically talks about how John Calvin's view of grace informs all of her stories and informs all of the ways that she sees life. And she says it's about un undeserved things that we just take for granted that God provides for us. And his provision is uh, uh, just so, so very generous that it almost feels given. But when we think, when we think through our lives at its base, what we come to realize when we see stories like this is that God has been literally pouring out his favor upon us at all times, and we have a hard time noticing it. And so I want to look at that today, how God provides, and through his provision, he transforms us and communities. So how does his provision lead to transformation? There are three uh, characters, in, three main characters in our chapter, Ruth, Boaz and Naomi, and there's sort of this other fourth character, which is the country of Moab. If you notice, uh, it says that she was a Moabite many, many times in verses 2, 6, 10, and 21. And Moab and Israel, they had, they had bad blood with one another. It was, it was different than Iowa and Nebraska. And um, the, the reason why it was different was that back in the day, when you put uh, a hex on somebody or you wanted to do away with a country or do away with a person, you would hire a holy person, like a priest, and that priest would curse a, a people or a, a person so that that person could be gotten rid of. Well, Moab hired this priest named Balaam to curse Israel, to stand on this mountain, to look down on Israel and to curse them. And what happened was that every time he got up to curse Israel, the people of Israel, nothing but blessing came out of his mouth from God, the God of Israel. And at one point in, in Numbers 24, um, when he's told to curse, <laughs> it's kind of it's comical because uh, Balaam gets up there and he's looking down at Israel and he says, Oh, Israel, you're like a bunch of palm trees. You're like this beautiful star. And later on in Israel's history, God explains what's happening there. He says, you know, Moab, Moab tried to curse you, but I turned that curse into a blessing, and therefore, I don't want you to associate with Moab for 10 generations. Don't even mess with them. And this story, Ruth, it, it wants to highlight the fact that she's a Moabite, that she's an outsider, that she doesn't deserve to come into God's favor and that's exactly what's happening. So that's, you fast forward into the life of Ruth and Boaz. Her ethnicity is highlighted and everyone sees it. And Boaz, what he's doing is that he's acting like God to Ruth as she comes into his, his field and comes into his protection. Um, in verse 10 and 11, many commentators think that this is the focal point of the chapter where Ruth says, why have, why have I found favor in your eyes as a foreigner? And Boaz says, all that you have done 
from your mother-in-law's, uh, from, from your husband's death to you taking care of your mother-in-law has been told to me, and how you left your own people in your native land and came to a people that you did not know. And what every commentator says is that that's the exact phrase that's used about Abraham and how Israel came into formation. And most commentators say that Bo, when he hears that, Boaz is thinking, this is who I am. I'm like her. And I'm realizing more of, of my relationship with God as this outsider comes into the people of God. And Boaz immediately recognizes that I want to show her grace. I want to show her favor. And the beautiful thing about this story is that when two people are controlled by this covenant love, this grace, this amazing thing happens. Uh, it begins to transform everything. An eternal community is actually being born in this story as Ruth meets Boaz. But it all started with this foreigner who came into the field of Boaz, and Boaz attentively responded to her like God responded to him. And so I want you to think about something for, for a moment, and that's sort of the background of this story. You know, oftentimes, if, if we have been, have been married or we have been in relationships that are romantic, if I ask you this question, that's kind of what immediately comes to mind. But is there somebody that you have met that from the moment they entered your life, it just t- it totally changed the course of the trajectory of where you were going, what you were doing. Um, this, is, this is what's happening with Ruth and Boaz, and God is weaving their stories together. And remember, Ruth, our, our series title is that when outsiders come in, She's going to be coming uh, into relationship with God through her relationship with Boaz. And how that happens for us today is that oftentimes, if you really think about how you came into a relationship with God and how you came into a deeper awareness of the gospel, it's through another human being. That that is, in essence, your, your purpose as a human being. And I know, this is, I know this is sort of crazy to think about. I'm not saying that you can be God in other people's life. That's not what I'm saying. What I think this scripture teaches is that God definitely wants to mediate himself through you. And that's your calling. That we are, we are here on this planet so that God can flow through us for blessing others. So that you can begin to understand that I actually, I actually am favored. That when God looks on me, he really is delighted. And I didn't do anything to deserve that. At the root of a human being, that, that's what controls everything. That's what is the center of everything. That's what... That's what needs to be remedied and redeemed in order for us to be those who give eternal life to those whom we're around. This is what's happening in this story. Everything changed on a dime when Boaz got into Ruth's life, and it does not stop there. It morphs into Naomi's life. And here's how I want you to think about uh, yourself. You know, we, we've uh, oftentimes in our denomination, we use the phrase means of grace. And a, mean, a means of grace is an avenue through which God makes him, himself known to you, specifically his love and his grace. And what I want you to begin to believe about yourself is that you, you are a means of grace. For the sake of everyone that you come into contact with. And it's not like, that. man, that's a lot of pressure. I think if you really, really think about it, that's what you want deep down. That you want to convey the, the love of God to any person you come in contact with. And the reason why is because you are his image. That's your design. That's where you will find yourself most satisfied. That's where you will find yourself most at rest when you sing out. When we, when we bless one another, when we listen. And we're going to talk about what that, uh, what that means. And, you know, I think about, 
Boaz, we can look at Boaz uh, and think, man, I, I'm not that, that generous. But I get the sense here in this story, it is a love story to a certain degree, but I get the sense that Boaz, when she entered his field, he was like, this is, this is my destiny. I'm moving towards her because I can't not. It was a, it was a calling on his life. And the reason why I'm saying that is almost every commentator says in verse, verse 3, it says, Ruth just happened to come into the part of the field belonging to Boaz. In the Hebrew, it says, her chance chanced upon his field. <laughs> just happened. Just so happened. It's like, well, there's more going on than chance. And what commentators have said about this story is that the deeper, the deeper narrative is that God is weaving the gospel into everyday life. And what he does, just like at baptism, he's pouring his hesed back into the world through, through human beings. And you can be a part of that if you want. That's an invitation. And that there's the, the beautiful part about this story, y'all, is like every other place in Scripture, aside from maybe the book of Daniel, like there... They aren't great people. But like Ruth and Boaz, they don't do anything wrong. Like they're good, they're good people to emulate. And that's very unique aside from Jesus in, in all of Scripture. And the reason why I think is because I, I believe that they are showing us this great allegiance and alliance which once belonged to men and women. Where there was no sin. There was no dominance, there was no manipulation, there was no hurt. And when we come back together again, driven by the grace and favor of God, it looks like God in the world when men and women come together. That's what's happening with Ruth and Boaz. Now, on the ground level, how did that transpire? Well, he, it's it's simple, in essence, he obeyed the law of God. He didn't glean all the way up to the edge of his field. Leviticus 23, 22 says, When you reap a harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after you, your harvest, but you shall leave some for the poor and for the sojourner. And in Deuteronomy ten nineteen, it says that the reason you are supposed to love the sojourner is because you too were once a sojourner when you came out of Egypt. Remember where you came from. And that everything is grace. Now, I want to get uh, very practical right now. And I want to do something that uh, requires your imagination, okay? I want you to imagine your life as a, as a field. And there are certain people in your field right now. And I want you, I, this may be a little weird, uh, I, want you, I, want you to no, I want you to notice them for a moment. Who's in your field? Now, this is not a question to induce guilt, but I want you to think of it in terms of a calling that maybe the, the Spirit of God, and if you don't believe in God, something's driving you to a particular area. And to a particular person, ask this question. What are you being called to notice and to give away? A deeper question. What if God is calling you to mediate him, himself through you to that person? Look, y'all, you've been given things in this life. Some of, its, some of its resources, like what Boaz had, or it, could, it very well could be your attention, your space, your time, your social life. Are, are there areas in your life where you are gleaning all the way up to the edge of your field and you know that you don't have to? And God is inviting us to think differently about how he provides. I was taking a walk this week with somebody in my family who needed to take a walk. And it made me feel like I was behind on work. Actually, feel like I was behind on writing this sermon. 
And uh, after the walk, I was walking by my neighbor's house, my neighbor Vaughn, and uh, he said, how are you doing? And I was like, you know, man, I'm a little anxious because I, I felt like I needed to spend the morning writing my sermon, and so I, I'm, now I'm behind. And he's like, you know, Matt, you're not going to get to the end of your life. This is, you know, this is when an outsider teaches an insider the gospel. He said, uh, you're not going to get to the end of your life on your deathbed and think, man, I wish I had ri- written a better sermon. Um, you're going to be thankful you took that walk. And I don't have to get to the end of my life. He's right. I was trying to glean all the way up to the edge of my field when I didn't have to. And what drives that hamster wheel in all of us that we got we to get to it, we got we to make sure, you know, we perform, is the fact that we don't, we don't actually, in our hearts, when we're, when we're driven that way, we don't actually think we have the favor of God. I think I got to earn it, that I got to get to it. It's a, it's a failure to believe that God's pleased and that you can rest. And so don't glean all the way up to the edge of the field. <laughs> it's okay. God's going to take care of you. Through his provision, you get transformed. Um, Tim, you know, Tim Keller, I went, was skiing with his son once, Michael. And Michael told me, he's like, you know, my dad lives by the 90-10 rule. And he gives, uh, so he sells all these books, and he gives 90% of his money away. And uh, he's like, and to be honest, I'm not happy about it because he's given away my inheritance. And I live in New York, and it's it's expensive. (laughs) And what he was doing, he, you know, Tim Keller was not gleaning all the way up to the edge of his field, even for the sake of providing for his family. Y'all, this, I mean, even non-Christians know this. Um, And it's beautiful when you see, this is the, the ripple effect of the gospel in community and into the world when we are actually as a, a whole community not gleaning up to the edge of our field. We see that it's good for society, and anybody can see it. One of the head executives of, of Facebook, and this guy was from Sri Lanka, so his name's hard to p- pronounce, but it's Chamat Paliapatiya. He's famous for being an extravagant tipper. He's a billionaire, he owns portion of the Warriors, owns this company called Social Capital, but he always, when he goes to a restaurant, he tips at least twice the amount of the bill and sometimes three or four times. And he said, as he was explaining, this is why I do it. He's like, it does make me happy. But the reason, the main reason why I do it is to see the transformational power of overabundant generosity. Not a Christian, but showing us the gospel. And many of you here in this room this is, what, this is what you do when you take in a foster child and an adopted child. So many of you have felt called to that, and it's such a great picture of what the Lord has done in your own heart. And you know it. I've heard you say it, that this, the way in which we're blessing this child is actually more, it's more blessing us because I'm reminded that I, too, am adopted into the family of God, that this, this is all of our plights. Again, this is the gospel's ripple effect when we exude grace and favor to one another, which is what Boaz does with Ruth. And Ruth is showing us the transforming power of of God and how she humbles herself. But this is what often happens when when an outsider comes into the community of God. What happens is that the insiders, it's almost like we get converted again. And that's exactly what happens in our text, that God's favor of Ruth actually begins to transform Naomi. Starting in verse 17, Ruth comes back with a load of barley and 22 liters, which for us Americans, that's about 50 pounds. It's the same amount that David took to his brothers when they were in a battle. The point is, it's a lot of barley, like more than you need. And, uh, When Naomi sees this, she says, in verse 20, Blessed is the man who took notice of you. And Ruth said, well, it was a guy named Boaz. And Naomi begins to see it at that point, and this totally changes the trajectory of her life. Boaz is of the clan of her late husband Elimelech, and from here on in the story, this is what's happening in Naomi's life. She begins to get filled back up. Remember, she went away empty. She came back to Bethlehem empty, 
and she's beginning to be filled back up through Ruth's favor from Boaz. And y'all, that's, that's the purpose of how we ought to view our life. That when, we, when circumstances are the bleakest, um, we ought to always remember this has always been God's plan A for us. That he's driving us to a place of, of emptiness in a certain degree because he wants to fill us back up so that we remember. It's all grace. It's all God's favor. And we're called to be attentive to the way that God works behind the scenes. There's a um, children's catechism question that says, Can you see God? Can you see God? And the answer is, no, but he always sees me. And that's what's happening in our story. And the moments when we need to trust that are when circumstances are the bleakest. So look, right now, I I want you to think about uh, the abundance that you possess. You don't have to be a Christian to think about this. You don't have to have an amazing amount of resources. You're here in this room that we have this moment, let's think, okay? We want to encounter God. God has given you extra in some, in some arena. And most likely, it is a particular way in which you have suffered. You have an overabundance of something. Brain power, patience, technological advancement, strength. You know your muscles, high schoolers, I work out at the Coppa YMCA and I'm always watching these high schoolers like, you know, flex in the mirror. Like your muscles are actually meant for the benefit of the world, not just to look at in a mirror, you know. Um, That's how a Christian thinks. You know that this is good for the world. What do you possess in abundance for the sake of others? When you, when you give that away, you guys, you come into the awareness that God favors you. When you don't glean all the way up to the field. And often when hardships come into your life, we are more like Naomi. We, we struggle with bitterness and we can't see our way out. But when, when we see that God so clearly provides at the very last minute, when we didn't have a chance then we actually have an opportunity for ourselves, we ourselves to be transformed by the gospel. To actually change. So that we can face the next hardship in a different way. This is what happened to Naomi through Ruth and Boaz. But it was really God all along saying to Naomi, hey, let's, let's start fresh. Let's start over. How do you think I see you? And behind the dark cloud, as him say, uh, you will eventually find God's smiling face. And this is not the end of Naomi's story. It's heading, the future is bright. Naomi was beginning to see, as one commentator says, that the Lord was not out to get her. That's, That's really challenging to believe sometimes that the Lord is not out to get you. Look, y'all, God, God provides, and through that provision, He transforms, and that happens through relationships. That's mediated through each other. And the question that I want to leave you with today, not in some sort of legalistic way, um, do you want to get in on that? Do you want to get in on that? I mean, He's going to do His thing without us, with or without us. I want to get in on that. Like Ruth and Boaz. Ruth and, Ruth and Boaz give us Jesus. They look like Jesus. You can look like Jesus too. Let's pray. Father, um, we ask that as we confess sin and we hear your assurance of forgiveness, that we would remember that we were so, so very poor and you made us rich in Jesus Christ. And the point of our lives is not our successes or our failures, but the point of our life is for you to move through us and to bless the world. And so, Lord, would we get in on that as we confess, as we come to this table. In Christ's name, amen. The generosity of God poured out to us 
Uh, I like the thought about uh, God's mediated presence. His generosity is mediated through us to others. And I thought about my mom uh, as the sermon was being preached. This is a perfect time to confess. Um, and that's what we're doing right now is going to confess our sin together corporately. Uh, but I thought about my mother who passed away in 2020. Um, short story is we were in hospital 2000-something uh, with my daughter who was diagnosed with cancer. And we're in there, and my brother bought so generosity all over the place. And, and I've, uh, my brother bought my parents uh, a rental car to come out to see us in the hospital. So they come out. My dad's like this, you know, longtime smoker, you know. They got to walk their little dog everywhere. Um, and my mom is, a, is just is a mind-haunted person who loves people. Um, and the gift that I receive by God through my mother was the gift of presence. She came into that hospital, sat there, and she's a longtime smoker too, uh, which I was at one point in time as well, so it's nothing to the longtime smokers. Um, but she, she had to drop the cigarettes for the day, um, and she came in to that hospital room and just went right by Amelia's bed, held her hand and sang to her the whole day, eight hours straight. Um, and I took a nap. I was able to take a nap for a few hours. Came back uh, to the room, and I was like, what would you guys do all day? And she's like, oh, I was just singing her all the songs that I used to sing you. Uh, and I was like, wow. Uh, generosity. Uh, that's from someone who doesn't know Christ. That's from someone who um, formally hasn't received or hadn't received the inheritance that God provides for those who cement their hearts with His. Um, and that's a powerful, that was in a powerful experience for me. Um, and the point wasn't to shame me because of my lack of generosity or anything like that, but the point was to point me to the one who is the source of generosity. Think how much more, if, 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 if someone like my mom, made in the image of God, points me to Christ, how much more to us who received and understand the source of generosity, profoundly different that is in uh, the world as we give out, as we pour out our generosity to others. We're able to tell them where that generosity comes from. Um, this morning is not a time to shame us uh, for our lack of generosity, but it's, it's to acknowledge and then to say, Christ, renew me, and let's start over. Let this be the day where I go out and uh, utilize my gifts in the ways that I was meant to, the ways that I was designed uh, to put on display the generosity of God for a watching world who's lost and harassed and helpless. And so we're going to do that. Uh, first, by corporately confessing, and then we'll take a moment to confess our sins uh, silently. But let's use the confession up here, uh, confession of sin. Let's confess together. Merciful Lord, we confess that with us there is the abundance of sin, but in you there is the fullness of righteousness and abundance of mercy. We are spiritually poor, but you are rich, and in Jesus Christ, came to be merciful to the poor. Strengthen our faith and trust in you. We are empty vessels that need to be filled. Fill us. We are weak in faith. Strengthen us. We are cold in love. Warm us and make our hearts fervent for you that our love may go out to one another and to our neighbors. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father God, you invite us to 
beseech you to fill us. So we do. We ask you to fill us. Uh, For those of us who would say on the surface that we've never experienced your generosity, fill us. Uh, Prove us wrong with your generosity. And we know it's true generosity when it's when it's fruitful for others, when it's poured out, when it's a Psalm 1 planted by streams of living water. And so would you do that in us? We pray, we confess that we have grabbed on to things, uh, false loves that have taken from us and put us in places that have cut us off from one another. Pray that you would bring us into the abundance that's provided for us in Christ. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. All right, friends, lift up your heads. Receive these words of assurance and forgiveness taken from 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. This is the word of God, amen. The part in the story where Boaz tells Ruth, like, hey, why don't you come sit at my table and um, dip your bread in the wine? Um, And I I love uh, when Justin, my friend, he he has a saying that there's always room for one more in his home. And uh, I think that's how the Lord Jesus would invite you to his table. Just like, come on, don't you want to come in? Don't you want to come around my table? Um, And so if if there's something preventing you uh, and you really want to be here at Jesus' table, if there's something in your heart like sin or you feel like you messed up too much this week, um, Jesus says, don't let that stop you from getting to me. Come. If you you want me, come. Come sit and come feast on the river of his delights. And so if that's where you are, please come up to this table. Our practice here is to come down in two rows. Steve is going to be on this side. I'm going to be on this side. The outer ring is grape juice. The inner clear cups are are wine. Uh, I'm going to pray, set the elements apart, and then after the musicians come, you, you are invited. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the abundance of your delights. Let us feast on you, Lord, by the Holy Spirit. These elements remain what they are, but just like... You mediate yourself uh, through people, Lord. You commune with us spiritually at this sacrament. Um, And so we thank you. We thank you for inviting us to your table. We thank you for giving us so much richness, for so much abundant wine and bread and so much fullness. And so, Lord, wherever we are, whether we're Naomi or whether we're an outsider, whether we're an insider like Boaz and Ruth, Lord, we come and we want to feast with you. And so uh, commune with us now in Christ's name. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and he said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I invite you up.
All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you're teaching us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together. And God, as we sing out, we declare your praise. So, uh, yeah, to you be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing one last song together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. And I was breathing, but not alive. bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in grace and peace. Five minutes, congregational meeting, okay? Five minutes. Call my-